giant hairy creature, part ape, part man. Indians call him Sasquatch. They believe he is as gentle as he is powerful and mysterious. He has been seen many times in the rugged mountains and deep woods of the Pacific Northwest. The encounters have not always been peaceful. In 1924, a small group of men were working a mine in a canyon near Mount St. Helens in Washington. One night, the miners took their weapons inside and bolted the door. They thought they were secure for the evening. Outside, something strange was happening. The cabin was under attack. Folders rained on the roof, and someone, or something, was trying to break in. The miners later described their attackers as large, hairy apes. The siege lasted several hours. escaped injury that night. The area now known as Ape Canyon is one of the many places in the Northwest where man continues his hunt for this elusive creature we call Bigfoot. <laughs> some possible explanations, but not necessarily the only ones to the mysteries we will examine. To the Indians living along the Columbia River in Oregon and Washington, or those in Canada, there is no need for proof of Bigfoot. Sasquatch has been a part of Indian lore as long as they've inhabited this land. Some anthropologists believe that the creature could have come to the northwestern part of the United States along with the Indians, across a land bridge that once connected Siberia to Alaska. The newcomers to this country have seen Bigfoot in an area ranging from northern California to southwest British Columbia. To the Indian, Bigfoot carries a mystical significance. Sometimes it's difficult to tell where myth ends and reality begins. In our modern world of concrete and steel, we're far removed from the Indian lore of Bigfoot. It's hard to imagine any corner of our crowded world where a giant, man-like creature could roam free. Yet there's persuasive evidence that Bigfoot is real, and that urban man may be close to his first meeting with this living legend. It is felt by some scientists that Bigfoot falls somewhere in this progressive chart of man, a giant hominid related to, but not like, modern man. According to this theory, Bigfoot would have pursued a course of evolution separate but parallel to his human cousins. Dr. Grover Krantz is an anthropologist at Washington State University. If locomotion is the human design, so we know it's probably our closest living relative, but uh, in terms of um, anything uh, mental characteristics, no, it's not human. So it is a mixture of ape and human characteristics. And if you want to call that a missing link, that's fine. Now, this is a cast of a jawbone of something that I think is actually the uh, uh, Sasquatch. This is a jaw that's anatomically in between human and ape in its teeth, but it's uh, much larger than any living ape, much larger than a gorilla, for instance. These are known from fossils about a million years old in China. 
and uh, it has been named Gigantopithecus, and it has approximately the characteristics that our Sasquatch has, so I'm inclined to think that this uh, species just simply is continuing today. The most convincing visual evidence of Bigfoot is a film taken by Roger Patterson in Northern California. Dr. Krantz believes it to be authentic. I've examined the film many times, uh, watching it forward, backwards, stop frame, measured, and everything. And all of the anatomy of the creature is perfectly consistent. <clears throat> it does, just simply does not fit with a man wearing a suit. In fact, a suit of that size, we can establish exactly how big it is. There's no way a man could fit into it. The shoulders and chest are simply too wide. The feet are um, properly designed for carrying that kind of body weight, and uh, that doesn't make any sense uh, uh, unless you've got a body of that size. And Patterson uh, could not have faked any of this stuff. I talked to him about some of the things I saw, and he didn't even understand what I was talking about. Reports of Bigfoot sightings in the Northwest go all the way back to 1811. There have been some in other parts of the United States, but most have come in the area from Northern California to British Columbia. In 1882, a British Columbia newspaper published the story of railroad workers who saw and captured a creature they called Jacko. No one seems to know what happened to that creature, but the hunt for others has brought headlines all across the United States. There have been an estimated 2,000 reported sightings of Bigfoot. Half of those are considered fakes. The other half are very real, especially to those who live in this rugged country and who've seen with their very own eyes, seen something strange and sometimes frightening. I'd been down to my folks' and Cindy was with me, and we decided it's time to go home, and so we left. And... Lewis Alway and his daughter Cindy of Stevenson, Washington, returning home one night from visiting his parents, came across something they'd never seen before. Uh, it was about... Oh, 10, 30, 11 o'clock at night, and Cindy was sleeping on the floor, I mean, on the seat. I come around the corner there, and, and uh, there it was. It looked to me like he had just come over the top of the guardrail there. I woke her up just before, and she got to see it just before I ran the brush, and at first I thought it was a bear, but when it took off across the road on the hind legs, I just, I just couldn't believe it. Now, I hunt and I fish and I see a lot of game all the time, and it, it looked like something that I've never saw before. Three or four years ago, uh, we received a call in the uh, late part of the fall. Uh, the people who own this cabin back here said they'd found some tracks of what they thought was a large animal. And uh, we came out and investigated that. Back here by the tree, we found uh, Several tracks that were real large, way larger than a human. I sure, uh, sure wonder about it. Sheriff William Klausner of Skamania County in Washington has investigated tracks and talked with eyewitnesses. He's seen too much to be totally skeptical. The most unique thing about what we've uh, learned from this is that the people who have either written or called who have experienced the same kind of thing or had seen tracks mention of uh, a strong sulfur smell, and that's uh, real unusual. As Sheriff Klausner says, the smell description is not unusual. James Strahan and Harold Teske recently saw something on the roadside near Colton, Oregon. And there was a big, huge uh, object on the left of the road, and I, I rolled the window down in the car, and uh, this thing was approximately three to a half, four feet wide, about six, seven foot tall. And the odor of this animal, after I rolled the window down, was so offensive that I couldn't remain there any longer. And I was scared, too. And I've, I've been around the mountains and around animals a lot, and this thing truly scared me. And uh, so I got out of there and, uh, and rolled the windows up in the car went on home. And uh, the odor... Uh, that animal stayed in that car until the next morning. It was still in there. One mile outside the Dalles, Oregon, several members of the Bigfoot Investigation Project and Information Center climbed to an observation point. 
They're led by Peter Byrne, 50-year-old adventurer and former big game hunter in Nepal. Byrne has dropped his rifle in favor of camera and binoculars. For five years, he's headed the Bigfoot investigation project and stalked these north woods, checking out every story and every set of tracks. His prey is elusive. We will talk to the person who says that they've seen one. Uh, we will talk to their family, perhaps to their employers or employees. Uh, we'll talk to the local police to see if they know them, to find out if the person is a, simply a joker, a hoaxer of some kind, or if they're um, a person of reputation and um, one of known integrity. And then we'll go and see the person, we'll interview them, and of course we'll try and get to the place of the actual sighting as quickly as possible. One of the most credible sightings took place near Mount Hood, Oregon in 1974. Two loggers, Jack Cochran and Furman Osborne, were working in an area of fallen timber. Cochran explains what he saw. I looked off towards the woods, and uh, I saw these two long legs moving at the edge of the timber. And as this thing walked, it, it walked with a glide, and then it reached an arm out and kind of touched the tree as it walked by. And I saw these wide shoulders, and then it just moved off down the hill. J.C. Rourke and I were up on that little hill there and set in chokers, and I kept, came down to the land and he didn't come back, so we decided to walk out in the woods on the timber so we could be in the shade, and we heard this commotion there in the brush, and he saw this big monster going out through there. And I yelled for my buddy, I wanted him to see him, and I started running. I wanted to get a closer look at him, and we chased him over the ridge there, and at one time I was within 50 feet of him. Whatever Osborne chased through the woods left him far behind. Cochran, an amateur artist, tried to sketch what he saw. He was tall, long-legged, and hairy, very broad shoulders, and his head seemed to just spring up out of his shoulders, no neck. The arms were long, and uh, in more in proportion than a human. There is persuasive evidence that men may be closing in on Bigfoot. What will the hunters do if they find him? And we'll just smooth it out a little bit, make sure it runs into all the cracks and corners. And that's really all there is to it. Peter Byrne, professional Bigfoot investigator. Before doing this, now... Hundreds of unexplained footprints have been found in these woods. They receive close examination by the experts. This is a plaster cast of an actual footprint here, and it's um, a 13 and a half inch cast, and it has a number of peculiarities. One is the, um, the normal bulge behind the big toe or the hallux, and then there's a second bulge, and this is peculiar to all of the footprints that we have seen. Um, nobody really knows what causes this second bulge. Perhaps it's a, a muscle of some kind to support the enormous weight. This is a cast of an individual that's very obviously crippled. And um, I studied this uh, some length and found these two bulges on the outside of the foot. Anatomically, they have to correspond to a couple of gaps in the bones in the foot themselves. And the, the bulges in a normal human foot expanded to this size would have been here, but they're shifted forward. Well, anatomically, this means that the ankle weight is shifted somewhat forward. It's not just a gigantic human foot. It's uh, the leverage has been redesigned. And this happens to be redesigned just exactly the way it would have to be for a 800-pound uh, animal. So if the idea of the, that this was faked by somebody isn't uh, quite so simple. If it was faked, it was uh, done by a, a human anatomist who was a real genius. And he had to have laid out thousands of these fakes all over the place and that uh, just simply becomes impossible. Among the, the fakery that we have seen is a piece of film made in 1970 by a man in northern Washington. At first it looked very good. It was um, a man in a fur suit, of course. Uh, the particular man tried to sell it to us for $25,000, and um, he told us that the creature in this movie was 8 foot 6 inches in height. But when we found the area, we were able to do our own measurements. And uh, we saw that the creature in the first suit, or the man in the first suit, was a little under six feet in height. This is, I think, is a good example of the kind of fakery that we have encountered uh, through the years. Throughout the Northwest, there are hundreds of men hunting for Bigfoot. 
Don Peterson, Jack Sullivan, and James Huskin have searched for several years. They believe the hunt will end with a bullet. Well, I think eventually somebody's going to bring one in. It's the only way. Uh, pictures aren't going to be enough because there's been film taken of these, of one of these creatures anyway. And it's in dispute. Like Jim said, if we uh, take a bunch of pictures, they're going to be under dispute. And if you can shoot one animal, you might be able to save the rest of them from everybody else from shooting them, too. And that sets up a conflict among Bigfoot hunters. Does it have to be killed to prove it exists? Through the centuries, the mighty Columbia River separating Washington and Oregon has cut a deep gorge on its way to the Pacific Ocean. It is a big, rugged, beautiful land where man holds a deep respect for nature. In Stevenson, Washington, they passed an ordinance setting a $10,000 fine or five years in jail for killing a Bigfoot. The people living in this country have a special relationship to the woods. They depend on the land for their survival. They may not totally believe in Bigfoot, but they believe in the possibility. And they don't want it killed, at least not in their county. District Attorney Robert Leake. We didn't feel that if there was such an animal, that the animal had ever harmed anybody, or that it had done anything that deserved to be shot or captured. We need a piece of the body. Nothing else will be accepted. I think that there are many other ways of proving the existence of something other than killing that particular thing that you're trying to prove exists. My preference would be to locate a hunter who has shot and killed one, and perhaps because he thought he killed a valuable animal or a peculiar human, he might not have said anything about it. But if he would uh, come forward, um, perhaps we could examine the place where he killed it, and we might find a few bones, and then the whole thing is settled right there. If we don't find such an old kill, then the only alternative remaining is to kill one now. And uh, grisly as that sounds, uh, I think that is probably what we'll have to do. I would uh, strongly urge the doctor to reconsider that, especially if he thinks he's going to do it in this county because we would enforce the ordinance. Why add more controversy to something that's already controversial? Though what we have to have is, is a, a specimen for scientific identification. I think it would be morally wrong. I see no reason. In fact, I talked to a small boy, a schoolboy recently, and he said some people say shoot one to prove that they're there. And then he said supposing they won, that the one they shoot uh, is the last one. Well, my answer to that is, uh, if they become extinct, uh, uh, so what? If they're not proven, it doesn't make any difference. We have a lot of animals that became extinct in the past, and there's nothing we can do about it. And if, we, if this animal remains unaccepted, uh, who cares if it becomes extinct? They're obviously rare. There are not very many of them. And as we see them, um, they could be a hominid form. It could be a man. To shoot one would be totally wrong, and um, we are totally opposed uh, to this philosophy. While men ponder the dilemma, to kill or not to kill, many Indians wonder why this preoccupation with proving Bigfoot exists. To the Indian, there is no doubt. Many, like Mrs. Joe Washington, see the hunt for Bigfoot just another intrusion into their sacred past. You'll never be able to, you might say, civilize them like the white man done to us. He's somebody that belongs in the area that he chooses to live in. And if someone did bring him down, he'd never adapt to your way or even mine. Because his way of life is entirely different from ours mine and yours. And I always felt so bad when I hear of Sasquatch hunters that say they're going to photograph this man, or most of them refer to him as an animal. And from the stories and things that I was taught by my people, that he is not an animal, he's not a savage, is a gentle being that just goes about his own way, collecting his own food, 
clothing and lives where he chooses. and machinery continues to stalk this creature. A creature described by the Indians as a gentle being, wanting to live in peace in his own habitat. A creature some scientists believe is a link to centuries long past. The gorilla is mentioned in, in Greek mythology going back hundreds and hundreds of years, and yet it was not discovered until the late 18th century. And the subspecies, the mountain gorilla, was not identified until early 1900. And um, there are other examples. The fossil fish that was discovered in the Indian Ocean only a few years ago, believed to be extinct uh, for 80 million years. This is the coelacanth, and now it's known to still live off the coast of Africa. Is that the case with Bigfoot? Is this creature really a relative of the Gigantopithecus, a primate that lived over one million years ago in China? The land lends itself to hide such a creature, there is food for it to survive. It does not need man. But it may have to die at the hands of man to prove to him that there is such a thing called Bigfoot. If we assume that Bigfoot is real and that men are closing in on this seemingly gentle monster, then we must prepare for that first meeting. To have eluded us for so long, Bigfoot must understand men very well. The burden will be on us to understand him. Bigfoot may well be waiting for some sign that we're ready 